All right, let me give that a second to figure itself out. Give me one second. Thank you for your time. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Oh, perfect. It's right there. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to give it a second to say hi. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's 8.30, so we're getting ready with the next presentation in just a second. Um, figured I'd give it a little bit of time. Hope you all have had a fun time with nesting season so far. Again, that is well underway, so that is a lot of fun. And wrens are definitely one of the fun ones during nesting season to find. Um, or just to see the results of, of their nest making anyways. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into it. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Jolene. I'm a certified songbird feeding specialist with Wild Birds Unlimited of Concord. And today we will be discussing wrens, which is honestly a lot of fun. These birds are tiny and sometimes can go unnoticed, but when they sing, they sing loud and they get your attention very quickly too. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you all are having a good day. Um, so I hope you guys are excited to learn a lot about them. I'm excited to share information about them and I have a lot lined up. So we're gonna go ahead and just jump right into it. If you guys have any questions during the presentation at all, definitely feel free to leave a comment. I am watching, um, good morning. So uh, yeah, definitely feel free to say so. I'll be watching over there. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and just jump right into it. Uh, so wrens are a part of the order Passeriformes, which does include all of our perching songbirds, but they're specifically in the family Troglodytidae, which is a lot of fun to say, but it's playing off the word troglodyte, which just means cave dweller. While wrens don't actually live in caves, they're often seen exploring small crevices and different locations and being um, farther back in like very heavy vegetation. So that name kind of fits for how they explore and how they forage as well. There are actually over 80 species of wrens, which is a whole lot of fun because if you're like me, you've maybe only seen one or two of these birds. Uh, one or two of these species anyways. Uh, most of these species live in the Americas. Um, they actually, a lot of them are found primarily in North and South America. Only one species is found in Europe and Asia, which is actually the Eurasian wren. Uh, for North Carolina, uh, there's actually five different species that we can find here in different parts and habitats of the state, which is a whole lot of fun as well. Uh, but a fun fact too, to point out, the winter wren, not until recently, used to be, um, let me, let me try that again. The Pacific wren, the winter wren, and the Eurasian wren all used to be considered the same species. But after scientists took a, another look at the species, they realized there were a lot of differences to make them three different species. So uh, the winter wren might look very similar to a few other birds that um, you might see depending on where you're located as well. Wrens themselves are also found in a diversity of habitats. Um, they can range from woodlands to deserts to marshes to tropical forests, grasslands and scree fields. So you can honestly find them in a lot of different locations. I think tundras are the only place that they don't like to go. And um, for an idea on the oldest lifespan, the Carolina wren, um, the oldest recorded, was found to be seven years and eight months old, while the house wren was at least nine years old. Again, they found this data from um, banding experiments as well, where they capture birds, band them, release them, and then these birds are later recaptured at a, at a oh, goodness, they're recaptured at a later date, uh, where they record the information since the last banding. Um, and then of course they're re-released afterwards as well. So when it comes to IDing these birds, I honestly like the um, shape is very distinct for, the, for them, which is a whole lot of fun. Uh, the wrens themselves have a small round body, a longer thin bill, and a pretty upright tail. Overall in size, they're pretty close to chickadee size, but that tail usually remains upright and is a pretty big distinction, as well as the fact that the wren's beak is a little bit longer and thinner than a chickadee. Of course, the colors are different as well. Wrens usually often vary in some type of brown coloration. The Carolina wren, which I find to be the most common one, at least for my location, um, has a very bright colored brown on its wings and tails, along with some barring that you can see that's a little bit darker, while their belly is a nice buff orange color, right? The main thing that sets these, these birds apart is they have a very distinct white eyebrow. Um, and along with that, they have a longer tail in comparison to their body size. Another thing with wrens is that their wings do point a little bit out past their body as well too, depending on their posture. Now, just because their tail does remain upright most of the time, it doesn't mean you can't find them with their tail pointed down. But most of the time when they're exploring and checking things out, they usually have that tail in an upright position. The house wren, which is another popular, uh, or not popular, common species found in these areas, actually has a little bit of a darker coloration 
and is kind of more uniform in style. Um, I lost the live stream, which is rude. I'm going to assume we're still good. Okay, cool. Uh, phones just kick you out for no reason. It's very rude. Uh, so with the house friends, um, they have, they still have that barring color. They don't have as much contrast in comparison like the Ren does. And they also lack that white eyebrow and don't have as much of a white contrasting throat as the Carolina Ren does. They're also a little bit smaller than the Carolina Ren, but that can sometimes be hard to see as well. Between the two species, the house wren also does have a shorter tail too. So that makes another difference for these birds. But like I said, North Carolina has five different species of wrens, depending on where you go in the state. So these are other three other species that we commonly have during certain times of year and in different habitats. We have the sedge wren, the winter wren, and the marsh wren as well too. So you'll notice all of these birds have a very similar posture compared to the other two wrens on the previous page. They still have that long, thin bill, and then their feathers are still have that barring in some way, shape, and form as well. Some have little eyebrows in comparison, but the Carolina wren, I think, has the most striking eyebrow of them all. <laughs> Of course, there's plenty of other different species throughout the uh, United States, North America, and South America. So it all depends on where you're at. Each wren will look a little bit different as well. Now, not only can you identify them by their looks, but they are quite loud when it comes to their sound. Um, usually, this is going to be a time where when you hear them sing, that's going to be where you um, have the best chances of finding them. Uh, so these birds, despite their size, are incredibly loud. The winter wren for its unit weight, has 10 times the sound power of a crowing rooster, and we all know how loud roosters are, right? So how do these tiny birds, uh, are, how are they able to produce such a loud sound? So just a reminder on some anatomy for you really quick. Humans have a larynx that's over at the upper part of their windpipe, right? Well, birds have a syrinx. It does the same thing, it's that little voice box, except instead of being up at the top of the windpipe, it's located at the bottom of the windpipe, okay? So at that location, it's also surrounded by a lot of air sacs, which is something that birds have that allow for more airflow in the body. But because of these two factors, it creates like this huge, nice um, acoustic chamber, or it just works together that helps amplify the bird's voice as it sings, and with wrens, it always shows, which is so much fun. Um, so I have a few different call, uh, songs that we can hear today as well, too. With the Carolina wren, it's probably one of the more distinctive ones. Um, a lot of people say that the song sounds like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, or procedure, 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 whatever like word you want to use, but it's basically like that quick, rapid, three-note sound. Um, so here is an example of that. Sorry if the volume is completely off. So it's kind of just a rapid three-part song, okay? So that is what the Carolina Wren often sounds like. Of course, these birds have a wide variety of vocalizations. Oftentimes for the Carolina Wren, the male is the only one that sings like that, while the female performs more calls. And there is a duet here that's really awesome that shows both of them working together. That rattling sound is the female Wren. Hopefully you guys can hear that okay. But um, honestly, it's a really fun sound. So you might notice that this time of year as well with um, nesting season currently happening. Now house wrens are a bit different because both the males and the females sing and it's kind of described as jumbled bumbling with some chirs added in. So this is what they sound like. Kind of sounds like a remix, I feel. Oh goodness, somebody's cats just came running when I did their calls. Well, there's still a few more coming up, so sorry if they freak out a little bit more. <laughs> but with the house wren, it's kind of a jumbled, um, long pattern of song as well, too. So there's, it is distinguishable. It's kind of more of that kind of remixed kind of sound. And it's a lot of that chattered buzzing as well that wrens are kind of known for. Now, winter wrens, which we usually get in the winter, hence their name too, have a really beautiful song as well. And it's very long. Uh, wrens definitely go for longer so uh, songs as well too, but it's that. Sad... 
but it's a lot of different notes, a lot of buzzing, a lot of churring. That one's a lot of kind of bells and whistles, which is really fun. But there's a lot of different styles and vocalizations for wrens, but they definitely make a statement when they do sing. So if it sounds a little chaotic, it could be one of your wrens in the area as well too, which is fun. Now, when you're looking for wrens in general, these guys often prefer to travel low to the ground. They stick to a lot of shrubs and thickets. And while, of course, they can fly high, they're more comfortable kind of flitting back and forth from bush to bush and in that dense un undergrowth. Remember, the family name was Troglodytidae. Um, so one thing is when you're looking for them, look low, because chances are that's where they're um, they're kind of staying pretty stealthy in those areas. And another behavior that they do enjoy doing are called dust baths. A lot of birds can perform this behavior, so it's not anything too surprising, but it is really fun to watch. So if you ever notice a bird doing something like this, uh, where basically they're just kind of rubbing themselves all over in the ground, that's known as a dust bath. This actually helps remove any parasites or mites that might be on the feathers of these birds. So it's actually a very healthy thing to do. So don't be surprised if you see a bird that almost kind of looks like it's seizing on the ground because most of the time that could just be a dust bath if it's in that location as well. Um, so it's a really fun behavior to watch. These guys are very common to use it. Um, I have seen some use the potting soil in our backyard to go for it. And it's just, it looks like a fun time. So if you ever see this behavior, it's common for wrens as well as some other birds too but it's a fun one to watch. Now, remember we said they kind of stick low to the ground. So when they're foraging, they kind of do the same thing. Um, they are primarily insectivores, so they eat a lot of insects and every now and then they'll eat some fruit and seeds to supplement their diet. Uh, these birds often kind of glean underneath the leaves and on top of the shrubs and things like that. They'll visit the trunks of trees to check for any types of insects that might be in any of the crevices. Uh, but they'll definitely investigate various locations for food items. Their curved bills are really good at turning over vegetation or hammering and shaking large bugs. But when you're looking for a wren foraging, compared to a sparrow, which kind of hops back and forth uh, over time, these birds, again, they move fast. They have rapid pace. So it's not surprising to see leaf litter move in various locations very quickly if it's a wren foraging rather than a house sparrow, or not a house sparrow, I'm sorry, a uh, like a white-throated sparrow or a, your other ground feeders that kind of hop, hop, and just check in different locations. So they move a lot of leaf litter around to kind of investigate and check things out as well too. So if you ever hear any leaf litter rustling, it's never, it never hurts to take a look because you don't know what kind of bird is foraging on the ground as well too. So when it comes to nesting, which is by far one of my favorite things about wrens, um, these guys go big or go home. They are hardcore nesters, which is always a lot of fun to talk about. Uh, most species of wrens are monogamous through nesting season. Some species are only with... Um, their mate through that nesting season and might pick a new one later on. Carolina wrens um, actually practice like a long-term monogamy. So they usually stay with like a long-term or a lifetime partner. So they work through multiple seasons with the same one. And they actually work to defend their territory year round once they've kind of staked their claim. House wrens are also interesting because these birds are very competitive. If there is a really good nesting spot taken by another species, they have no problem attacking other birds, nests, and their young if they are interested in that site. One thing that is also curious is that first year uh, males that haven't gone through a nesting season yet will actually settle nearby an older male to learn the ropes of what's more effective, right? So, um, it's actually a mix of, for these birds anyways, instinct on what to do and the best ways to nest, but also learning and figuring out what ways are more effective, which is really interesting as well. Um, something that is fun is that the females, of course, pick the male that they choose to um, nest with, not by any factors of the male specifically, but because of the nesting site that they've picked. So that's also really interesting because what males will do is they'll actually start multiple small nest sites and attempt to cover all their bases and be like, well, this site looks good and this site looks good. So you have to try and make multiple areas so that the female doesn't go, oh, you know, there's nothing really good here, right? So the male will make multiple nests or decoy nests for some of us as we find that those nests aren't used later in the season for the um, pair to actually start to go nest hunting. So once a female has checked out a male's um, territory, the pair works together to investigate the nesting sites before they decide on the one that they want to use that season. So 
As they pick the nest, the pair actually, one will often stay by the nest while the other one goes to collect materials. But the male will often build the outer structure because he already started that anyways. And then the female usually builds the lining. Of course, this varies with each species, but for the most part, it's usually that kind of um, co-effort by both of them pretty much. Um, so the nesting sites and the styles do vary, but one thing that is commonly found is that nests that are in an enclosed area and well protected like a cavity or a secure location are often just an open cup nest, while those that are more exposed and in a more open area are a domed nest so it's completely covered and it has a slight side entrance, right? So these nests take about four to seven days to build and here are some of the results that we can see as well too. For this top nest, which was a Buick's wren nest, the, um, there was a seat that was actually covering this location, so that is why it's more of an open cup nest style. Meanwhile, for the Carolina wren, we can see the beginnings of that kind of domed nest and structure, so it's well protected. And then for the winter wren, they decided that this one wire was absolutely good enough to support a nesting structure, and they just kind of went ahead and ran with it. So these birds will pick some very curious locations and uh, go from there. They are definitely not deterred. The sky is the limit, pretty much. Um, some other styles in birds that aren't necessarily in our area include the cactus wren, which they actually build their nest on a cactus and they have a side uh, entrance as well. The canyon wren, which picks quite a few different locations, but this one is an open knot in a uh, tree that they basically just kind of secured a nest in and you can see one of the little mouths of the babies right here. And then the marsh wren, which of course we do have more in the marshy coastal areas of our state, actually builds a kind of woven-like structure that is their uh, nesting habitat as well too. So it's really cool to see the variety of styles that these wrens use. They are definitely not deterred, which is a whole lot of fun. So when it comes to nesting, these guys pick a variety of materials. Um, here is the house wren, and then you also have the Carolina wren there. Um, it does vary between bark or sticks or pine needles, depending on the species. House wrens are more likely to use feathers and spider eggs, actually. We don't know if the spider eggs are more of a decorative aspect to nest building or if it's made so that when the eggs hatch, they actually help clean up a lot of the mites that could possibly be in the nesting site. We're not really sure, uh, but it is interesting to see that they do that as well. Uh, meanwhile, Carolina wrens are more likely to use the pine needles and some moss, but they'll also both equally use plastics or strings. So when it comes to the amount of broods, wrens in general can have anywhere from one to three broods. So it's not uncommon for wrens to kind of nest throughout the season from March to August in our location. Um, house wrens have anywhere from three to ten eggs, and then Carolina wrens can have anywhere from three to seven, but they average about four. Uh, so <laughs> Sally said, Carolina wrens like to build nests in, my, in her garage. I have no doubt. Honestly, if there's an open spot that looks pretty good, they will just build a nest there regardless of what you think. So if there's anything that you don't, <laughs> at this point in year, you don't want to leave anything sitting out too long because the next time you look, you might have a nest built on top of it. They move fast. Um... So one thing we might notice too is I have two pictures of different types of nests here. On the left is a Carolina wren nest with the eggs and on the right is a house wren nest, okay? So with the Carolina wrens, you notice they have that buff white coloration and then they also have the rustic kind of red brown color on the end, like the larger end of the egg, right? So it kind of produces that line, but then it's also speckled throughout, okay? For the house wren, the colors are a little bit more uniform, okay? So you have, it's more of that kind of reddish brown color all throughout, but at the base of the egg, once again, it's a little bit deeper in coloration. So this varies depending on species and individual, of course, and it's not surprising to find one egg in the, in the brood to be a little lighter than the others because it's pigmentation, so sometimes that happens. Um, when it comes to incubation and nesting, these guys take about four to five weeks to officially leave the nest, about two weeks to incubate the eggs, and then once they hatch, they are altricial young, which we'll talk about in a second, um, and the nesting for once they hatch takes about 10 to 17 days. Uh, so it really doesn't take long for these birds to kind of get out of the nest, and that's always good too because you don't want to be sitting too long when there's always potential predators nearby.
So like I mentioned with the nestlings, they're all trishal young. So what that means is when they hatch, they are blind, naked, defenseless. They can't fend for themselves. They require completely on the, the parent's care for at least two weeks. And finally, once they've fledged, they actually remain with the parents for about two weeks more, or at least the Carolina wren does. Your difference between your nestlings and your fledglings, because we have to go over this because nesting season's finally here, um, your difference between the two is that your nestlings always have some kind of pink color. You can usually see their skin. Their feathers are not completely developed or they're not fully, they haven't fully erupted from like the feather shaft either. So you can kind of notice that as well too. They don't look like they have all their stuff together, right? The fledglings are a little bit different because a lot of their wing feathers and a lot of their body feathers are pretty much done. Uh, they do have some like fuzzy tufts at the top which can happen as well too, because they're still working on it. And for most fledglings in general, they often have a shorter tail because it hasn't fully grown yet, okay? So these birds are usually the ones that stay with their parents for around two weeks before they kind of disperse on their own. So if you happen to see a fledgling bird kind of on your porch or investigating your yard and they're by themselves, that's okay. They don't require as much care at this point in time compared to a nestling. The parents are probably nearby keeping an eye out and observing from afar. So if you happen to see a fledgling and you're not too sure what to do, keep an eye out for a little bit. Does the bird seem bright and alert and responsive? Is he kind of looking around? Is he checking things out? Is he calling? These are all behaviors that you want to see, right? Keep an eye out for a little bit longer and you might see the, the parents come by and feed occasionally. So that is also not too surprising. If you have a case where you notice that the fledgling is visibly injured, so if there's bleeding, I would say if you could see a broken wing, but sometimes these guys barely know what they do, they're doing, so they like kind of flop around already. But if you notice something very obvious and injury, or if you notice that the fledgling is unresponsive, so very maybe cold, withdrawn, even if you approach, they still remain... Um, there's a difference between like if they're sleeping and if they're really unresponsive. Um, but if you notice any of these concerns, then please contact a wildlife rehabilitator first because they'll be able to get that bird up on its feet and, fa oh my goodness, help that bird get back on its feet faster than you might be able to just because they know um, the progress and what the bird needs at that point in time. And it saves a whole lot of trouble in the long run as well. But for the most part, watch for any of those behaviors first. Let's see. So Julie said her year-round Carolina wrens, they've named them Garth and Trisha, are currently nesting in a bluebird box I re reconstructed by cutting the top of the entrance completely off to allow a larger opening and hung the box right outside my patio back door. Let's see. For the past three years, I allowed them to nest in my garage storage room and made sure the door was open all day. All oh, these birds are my, they're honestly a lot of fun. That is definitely an, like an investment as well too. Wrens really are very interesting and curious in the places that they nest and just how that whole process goes. So I'm glad you're having a fun time with them, Julie. That's awesome. All right. Um, oh wait, actually I wasn't done. I wasn't quite done yet here. So if you have a bird where you think something is wrong and you're not really sure how to proceed, uh, for the state of North Carolina anyways, you can go to ncwildlife.org slash injured hyphen wildlife because that's going to lead you to a register of all of the rehabilitators that are registered for North Carolina. And that'll give you a better idea of who to call, who to contact, what to do, and um, especially if you're in a different location in North Carolina. For each state, there, if, at least for the United States, there is a registry for each state that shows who is a registered wildlife rehabilitator. So you can go state wildlife rehabilitator, or like insert, insert state name here. And that usually kind of clears things up and you can get a good list of current rehabbers in the area at that point too. Um, I might work a little bit differently for um, Canada as well as other countries too, but it never hurts to Google and see who's in your area as well. So again, like I said, once they, goodness, some mornings you just can't talk, right? <laughs> um, so uh, once the birds have fledged out of the nest box, they usually stay with the parents for two more weeks. And after that, they're kind of on their own. Thus, the whole life cycle begins again, which is a whole lot of fun. Um, but if you want to try to attract these birds to your yard, because they really are such a joy to watch, um, having areas like brush piles, small shrubs, and undergrowth are in your yard are going to be what's more attractive to a wren as well, too. With the brush piles, they don't have to be crazy big, and they don't have to be, like, expansive, but just something small is really good for protection for a wide variety of birds. 
um, either whether they're looking for food options or whether they're trying to stay away from certain predators. It just provides more protection. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, if you have a nice dirt patch or a little area of potting soil, it's really fun to watch them do dust baths. Uh, so that's just that's just my opinion. You know, you never know what birds you'll see kind of interacting with that area as well too. Um, food wise, if you don't want to change anything in your yard or don't have access to that, things like suet, mealworms, and deshelled seed are all a really good option since these birds are primarily insect eaters. Um, they are a huge fan of suet and they're very capable clinging birds. So they will eat from the same suet feeders that a lot of woodpeckers do. So definitely feel free to go for that as well. Um, and then kind of like Julie mentioned, these birds do use nest boxes too. Uh, they are technically cavity nesters despite the various locations that they try and use. Um, so they are one of the few to use the hanging nest boxes, okay? So if you have a hanging box, um, they are gonna be the ones as well as chickadees that will be more likely to use those. Those have to be at least a one inch diameter opening. They can be larger, which is not a problem. And having any of these uh, nesting boxes face east to southeast is really good for them as well too. It helps kind of keep away prevailing winds and everything like that as well. Of course, you can also use the bluebird boxes as well. They have a one and a half inch diameter opening. Bluebird boxes are called bluebird boxes because everybody really enjoys the bluebirds that will use them. But other birds like chickadees, wrens, and titmice will also utilize those, not, those boxes as well. Um, so either of those are really awesome choices to go for too. Let's see. She, let's see, Julie said she also makes sure she has some mealworms for the fledglings if they drop out of the box so the mom can feed them to gain their strength to move on to the woods behind. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, offering like a little small option. A lot of people do this with bluebirds too. If you have a nest box that you're currently have a, um, a brood or a parent is working, oh my goodness. Again, like I said, words are hard. If you have a currently active nest box, something that you can do is provide a small amount of live mealworms or dried mealworms, just because both are really good sources of protein. Uh, live mealworms are probably a little bit easier to feed to the young. Um, and just having a small amount that they can kind of utilize from there as well too. Areas where you don't use pesticides are also very helpful because that helps the uh, native insect population thrive, which also in turn helps your bird population thrive. So the less pesticides you use, the better chances your birds will also have to use natural resources to gain the uh, protein and the calcium that they need as well to have a nice long and healthy life too. Um, so let's see, I think that's pretty much anything everything there I have to say on that one. Um, so for listening to me today, thank you guys so much. Um, if you're planning on coming into the store today, I do have a $5 off $25 sale coupon. The coupon code is REN. Uh, it's only available today, either through in-store or phone order. So feel free to give us a call or stop in if you'd like. We do have a second viewing of this presentation in-store as well too. So if you know someone in the area that maybe wants to come check it out or maybe should come check it out, uh, feel free to let them know today as well. Uh, with that said, thank you guys so much. These are the resources that I used. Uh, Macaulay Library is really awesome because it's a it's a archive where people like us, everyday people basically post their pictures and videos and sound recordings of all these birds. And it really gives you a good idea of the behaviors and lifestyles. All About Birds is really awesome as well too because they give a lot of good resources if you're looking to learn more about a specific bird in general, songs, calls, location, all that kind of stuff as well too. And remember, if you find any injured wildlife in the state of North Carolina, you can use ncwildlife.org slash injured hyphen wildlife because that'll give you a really good resource to figure out who to contact and how to move from there as well too. Uh, so with that said, thank you guys so much for joining me today. I hope you really enjoyed the wrens as much as I do. Uh, chances are you'll see a lot of them this season if you're in the right area as well too. Um, so with that being said, I'll leave you guys to hopefully a wonderful weekend. The weather's looking nice where I'm at right now. So hopefully it's the same for you. Uh, with that being said, thank you so much and I will see you guys next month. Have a good day.